Hello and welcome to Account Instruction Help and How To. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about market failures, those areas where markets have problems. We'll be comparing and contrasting those problems to government failures, those areas where the government has problems in the decision-making process within the market. We will be able to define externalities and discuss their impact, describe methods of dealing with externalities, define the term public good and explain the impact of public goods, and explain why market failure is not necessarily a reason for government intervention in all cases. So we're going to look at those areas where the market has problems. We're calling them areas of market failure. This is the area when we think of the news, when we look at media, this is often where we're going to focus in on. Why? Because it's the, where the problems are, and that's where we need to go in and see if we can fix problems within the market. It's good to keep a bigger picture, though, when we look at these ideas, and that is that, for the most part, the interchange of supply and demand uh, the market does answer our economic questions in terms of what to produce, how to produce, how do we distribute them pretty well, meaning it's a very good tool. Markets in themselves are generally going to be a really good tool. That's going to be the default tool that we're generally going to think of. We're going to think we're going to have market forces as much as possible. We're going to look for those areas where market forces have problems, and then we want to go in and see if we can shore up those problems with some other tools, possibly government intervention in terms of regulation and whatnot at those points and times. But it's good to keep the bigger, broader picture here in that the market is generally the default tool that we take a look at and then we shore up any problems for the most part with some other tools where we have those market failures. We're going to be taking a look at those market failures now. So a market failure is a situation which the market forces cause individual decisions uh, that do not lead to socially desirable outcomes. So remember the idea of the market of course is that we have people making self-interested decisions and because people have different self-interested decisions based on the fact that there's scarcity and everybody has to make decisions based on scarce resources, those decisions lead to equilibriums. They lead to the economic questions of what we should produce, how to produce, and how should they be distributed fairly efficiently. So the market, for the most part, fairly efficient, but there are situations where people making those self-interested decisions lead to outcomes that are not efficient for society as a whole. That's when these market forces are considered to be not efficient in terms of the optimal outcome in terms of society's costs and benefits. And those things that we will take a look at in this lecture will be externalities, public goods, and imperfect information. As we look at some of these problems within the market, oftentimes we tend to start to think, well, maybe the solution is to have the government just basically take over certain areas within the market. And it's important to note that there could be government failures as well. There's a lot of areas where the government can uh, step into the market in ways where they don't really recognize what the impact to people's behavior will be leading to undesirable outcomes. And one of the big problems with the government intervention is a similar problem w that we would have with like a monopoly, and that is that we'll have a small group of people trying to make those decisions in terms of what to produce, how to produce it, who's going to get what is produced. And when we have a small group of per people rather than a market making those decisions, it can be difficult for, for the small group of people to know what the optimal outcome, what the optimal level of production and what to produce is without those market forces. So we need to have a trade-off basically from the idea of market tools, when do market tools work, when do market tools have problems, when they do have problems, how can we use both market tools and some type of interventions in such a way that have to get lead us to optical, optimal outcomes without taking steps that actually are hindering the process. First we'll talk about externalities. So externalities are the effects of a decision on a third party that are not taken into account by the decision making. They're, they could be positive or they could be negative. And when we talk about positive or negative, we're talking about positive or negative to the third party. But as a whole, both positive and negative externalities have problems to society as a whole. They lead to non-optimal outcomes. So both positive and negative externalities are problems in terms of the society as a whole. So, for example, if we have a negotiation between two people, A and B, and we're going to say there's a negative externality in this case, that's when person C is affected by the deal between basically A and B. And, of course, person C doesn't have any say in the deal between A and B. And that's going to be the problem that those costs in terms of C in this case are not being included. And therefore, we have this problem in terms of the society's costs are going to be greater for, for negative externalities than the cost to the two people involved that are, that are making the decision in this case. Most of the times when we, when we think about a decision between two people, if we have A selling something to B, we consider the fact that, well, A wants to get the highest price and B wants to get the lowest price. And if there's a free market and free decision and everybody has all the information needed, 
then they're going to get the market price. They're going to negotiate and they're going to uh, find that market price through them both pursuing their self-interest within that agreement. But if their agreement is affecting C, then that's the problem. C's costs are not being included in there. So, for example, if we had a, a uh, property A was selling to B, selling property to B, B buys the property and puts like an airport on the property. Well, the airport might have a lot of noise, which could affect person C. <laughs> so person C may not be happy with the airport. They, they, they are negatively affected by the transaction between A and B. And uh, those costs then to society, to C in this case, are not included in the negotiation. What that will lead to is the fact that more of these types of negotiations would happen than would be optimal for society because these negative externalities aren't in the negotiation. They're not in the income statement. They're not being accounted for in uh, the actual negotiation between A and B. That's the problem. Many other type of arguments are going to use this externality type of argument as well. So even things like smoking, should we reduce the amount of uh, smoking that's in public places and whatnot? That's usually basically a negative externality argument because the idea is that the secondhand smoke is affecting other people. So the negotiation between buying cigarettes from the store, the cigarette company, and the individuals purchasing the cigarettes, that's between A and B. But the smoking of the cigarettes is, is affecting C. That's going to be an externality type of argument. So you can see that whether you agree with the, these arguments or not, it's good to know what these arguments are so that you can you know, think through them uh, and participate in the, those kind of, of discussions. On the positive externality side, we have the same type of thing except for C now benefits. So A and B have this negotiation and C now is benefiting from that negotiation. So now let's say A sold the property to B, but now B, instead of putting an airport on it, puts a mall on it, which actually attracts people and, and increases property value for C. So now C didn't do anything. C just kind of benefited from the fact that A and B had this negotiation. C has a positive externality. And so, and, and this would be a good thing to see. Uh, and, and another, edu another example of this that's often cited and argued for uh, is education, meaning that the people paying for education are people that actually often produce more in society and therefore society as a whole benefits through education and that, and the payment of, and that's the argument for the payment of the education being subsidized. Again, you can be on either side of that argument, but you really want to know where the argument is coming from. It's coming from this externality argument, meaning that uh, we, we need more education and the cost of the education between uh, the school and the individuals paying for it isn't taken into effect the, the benefit to society. And that's, that's going to be an argument for doing something about increasing the education. Now, from the standpoint of C, we're talking about C, the, the individual that is either not benefiting or benefiting from the negotiation between A and B, we can see that a negative externality is, of course, bad for C, and a positive externality is good for C, that one third person. However, from a society standpoint, both the positive externality and the negative externality are bad because they don't lead to optimal outcomes. For example, the negative externality is clearly going to be bad because the, these negotiations will keep on happening uh, at a greater level than society would want because these costs are not being included and therefore we're going to have these, these negotiations, more of them happening than would be optimal for society. So that's going to be bad that the positive externality is bad for society because these benefits that people are getting, that the, the benefit that, people, that C is getting is not being included in these types of negotiations and therefore, less of these types of negotiations would happen than society would want if for somehow we can get the benefit included in the negotiation price. And that's going to be the argument, of course, on the educational side of things. Uh, how can we increase education if we can get the, if we can get the benefits to society somehow uh, figured into that, to that calculation, the positive externalities included? we would end up with more education. Let's break this down a bit further, first focusing on the negative externalities. So negative externalities is when the marginal cost is greater than the marginal private cost. So the marginal social cost, I should say, the cost to society is greater than the marginal private cost. So we're always thinking about decisions being made on the margin. The marginal social cost includes the marginal private cost plus uh, the negative externality. So note that if there was no externality, then these things would be equal. The marginal social cost would be equal to the marginal private cost because if the negotiation was between A and B and no one else was affected by that, then the effect to them, those private individuals, A and B, would also be included in the total effect to the society as a whole and the, the two things would be equal 
and everything would be great. But because of this negative externality, the cost between the people making the decisions A and B is not the, the total cost. The total cost includes someone else. That's going to be the idea of the negative externality. Therefore, the social costs are higher than the private cost between the two individuals. We were to graph this, we can imagine our supply and demand graph. We've got the price on the vertical axis. We've got the quantity on the x-axis. So from bottom to top price, from left to right quantity, and we're graphing the uh, supply and demand. So from left to right, demand is sloping downward. We're going to call this demand the marginal social benefit to society. So this demand curve is the demand for society. And if we go from left to right and we draw the, the supply curve going upward, we're going to imagine this to be the marginal supply for society. So this is kind of our imagined optimal uh, graph where we have society, supply, and demand. If we were to graph the marginal private supply curve, then it would be kind of to below and to the right, meaning that at every price, the, the supply that's actually happening on the market would be greater than what is in the marginal supply and you can and you can see that because if you if you look at the cost we're saying that there's costs to society that are included in the marginal supply curve for society that aren't included in the marginal private costs therefore the marginal private cost is going to be below and to the right and at any given price uh, suppliers are willing to produce more than would be optimal for the society as a whole so if we imagine the optimal point we're, we're going to be producing uh, at a cost that's higher than that because we're not including these costs between the people that are actually making the decisions. This is going to be the problem of the externalities and this is where the discussion happens and, and the discussion would be well should we have some type of government intervention in order to shore up this problem so that we can be producing at more of an optimal level. Of course there's, there's problems with this because notice when we're thinking about this we're thinking about it theoretically. Theoretically it all makes sense theoretically but it's harder to measure the, the, what the actual dollar amounts are or what the uh, action should be. And we'll talk more about that as we go. Now we'll drill down further on positive externalities. So when there is a positive externality, the marginal social benefit is greater than the marginal private benefit, meaning the marginal social benefit includes the marginal private benefit plus the benefit of the positive externality. So again, if the, if the transaction was just between A and B and there was no externality, then the the benefit to A and B would be the same in terms of private and that would be part of the social and that would be the same. But if we have C over here that's also benefiting and they're not including included in the decision making, then the private benefit between A and B is different than the overall social benefit. If we were to graph that out, they have the price on the Y axis from bottom to top, price going up from bottom to top, and we've got the quantity on the X axis going from left to right. We've got a familiar demand curve going from left to right sloping down. If we imagine the demand curve for the marginal social benefit for society as a whole, and we have our supply curve going from uh, sloping upward from left to right. The intersection between supply and demand being the optimal place, and we are imagining demand being our social benefit for all of society. Now, if we were to compare the demand curve with the demand for the private, those people that are actually involved in the transaction, we would shift the demand curve would be uh, below the social demand curve. Meaning for every price, there's going to be less demanded. Because the marginal benefit, the benefit that's actually happened between the decision makers are not included within the demand curve between the private individuals. That person C, that social benefit is not being included. Therefore, for society as a whole, we actually have less quantity being produced than otherwise would be. And that's going to be our problem. That's going to be the problem of a positive externality. And again, we could have some type of government interaction in order to try to shore up that problem so that we can bring the equilibrium point to the best most optimal place from uh, the the social standpoint how can we optimize things for society as a whole recognizing these problems how can we uh, adjust the market in order to get to these more optimal outcomes if we say that uh, the market in these certain areas is not resulting in the optimal position for markets in terms of uh, the social policies and social markets then what can we do in terms of government intervention we could have direct like regulation for example is the government could just limit the amount that we can consume. They could just say, hey, we are limiting the amount of consumption to this level. We could try some type of incentive policies. We'll talk about a couple incentive policies that we could have. And we could try just, just voluntary uh, regulations basically saying to the public, hey, there, here's the problem. We would like this type of action, such as you know reducing water consumption or something like that, and try to explain the problem. 
and have a voluntary uh, participation in the solution. One common method is going to be to use the tax code. So if we're going to use some kind of incentive policy, it's possible to use the tax code in order to incentivize. So for example, a common example would be pollution. So if we're talking about individual pollution in terms of like car usage, car pollution, or if we're talking about uh, companies having types of pollution, we could put basically a tax on pollution. So there's different kind of ways that we could put a tax on pollution, possibly a tax on uh, gas or something like that, or a tax on pollution emissions directly are some ideas in terms of how we could uh, put some incentives to lower the amount of pollution. The idea being to determine what the cost of that negative externality is, something that's not really easy to do, but if we were able to get the cost of that negative externality and then make the tax to be basically equivalent to that negative externality, then the cost would actually be on the income statement. So if we think about our, our basically consumption of gasoline, the pollution isn't involved in our income statement. It's not involved in our budgeting decision. Uh, in order to make the decision on how much to drive. If it were somehow, if it were somehow on our income statement in our budget, then we would be more likely to uh, account for it and then uh, respond accordingly and uh, be more in tune with the social optimal market position. The same is going to be true with large corporations. If they're having pollution, such as air pollution, if there's air pollution out there, the idea then would be that if we could somehow tax that air pollution for the externality, then now it would be part of their income statement. They would then have an incentive to reduce the uh, amount of emissions just because it's part of the cost that is included in doing business. Of course, the problem when we look at it on that term is the fact that if we have uh, the law in one area and the law isn't involved in another area, meaning the, the one law has a tax for air pollution and, and they're competing with people that don't have taxes on air pollution, then of course we kind of handicap the companies that have the tax on the air pollution when they're competing against others who do not. So. Uh, a lot of these types of laws in those cases would need to be kind of universal in order to optimize the position. Add to this idea and put in more market forces. For example, if individuals who reduce consumption uh, by more than the required amount receive market certificates that can be sold to others, that would be an idea to put market forces into the equation here. So for example, if we don't just say that uh, the cost of air pollution is this, if we then say that you need to get air pollution down to this level, and if you get it down further than that level, then the idea being that uh, they can trade that excess level to somebody else and now and that being creating a market. And so that would give incentives not to just put the, the cap at a certain level, but to actually go below the certain level. And it gives that incentive to do so by being able to trade that excess to some other company, given that market incentive for companies to do better. Uh, in that area. And then we have the voluntary regulations. We could have voluntary regulations and ask individuals to have some type of behavior in order to optimize the outcomes. For example, to, to use less water or to, do, to have less fishing or something like that. Now, the problem with that is that people often have a free rider effect, meaning they see that their outcome is going to be insignificant as a whole when taking on the aggregate and often when people see other people that are not in, you know, reducing their consumption, it, the tendency is to start to think, well, my consumption is irrelevant to the whole and therefore it shouldn't matter. So we have this free rider effect, whereas individuals are unwilling to share the cost of the public good for this reason. The free rider effect being one of the problems that uh, we will have. It's important to consider what an optimal policy is. So we're going to define an optimal policy as one in which the marginal cost of undertaking the policy equals the marginal benefit of that policy. Now this is going to be different than what we might intuitively think of as an optimal policy. For example, if we're talking about a pollution policy, the optimal policy isn't to have zero pollution. For the most part, society doesn't generally want to have zero pollution because in order to get to zero pollution, we would have to give up a lot of things. And therefore, as a society, we're generally willing to have some level of pollution. The question is, what is the optimal level of pollution? And that, that's what needs to be decided. So if resources are being wasted, if the policy is not optimal. So if we have a policy that's not optimal, then we have waste. We're not being efficient in terms of the, the wants and desires of the society. Now we're going to move and define public goods. We're going to say what public goods are and the public goods are going to have two characteristics. They're going to be non-exclusive and non-rival. Non-exclusive and non-rival. What does that mean? Non-exclusive means that once the public good is put in place, then everybody benefits from that public good. We can't restrict the public good from benefiting certain individuals. Once it's in place, everybody benefits from it. Non-rival means that once uh, one person consuming 
some of the public good does not limit someone else's consumption of public good. Most public goods being areas where we do believe there should be some type of government intervention, the biggest one being the military and often infrastructure are going to be areas where we believe that there should be government intervention due to the fact that we have public goods. For example, if we're looking at the military, the military, if we have a, the military being put in place and it's there to safeguard individuals to keep citizens safe, then it's impossible to put in the military without every citizen benefiting from the military. This is going to be what's difficult to have it run on the private side, because if we just had private militias and private militaries, it's difficult to get the incentive, the incentive to create the uh, military without getting the benefit from everybody basically paying for the military, because once the military is put in place, everybody benefits even if they have not paid for it. That's going to be the free rider effect. And because of that, it's going to be difficult for uh, the market forces to be involved because in a normal good, there would be the transaction that the people that benefit are the people that are involved in the transaction. And the, and the good of a public good, once the good has been put in place, everybody benefits, such as the military being put in place, everybody benefits. Therefore, uh, the, there's going to be a free rider effect. Therefore, it's thought that the military is going to be something that's going to be need to be handled by the government. It's one of the first and main most important things that most governments believe that uh, needs to be handled by the government is the military. So the federal government's one of their major goals is going to be the military. We also have other infrastructure items which often have the same kind of argument being things like the roads. If we talk about the freeway system, same kind of problem happening. Whereas if you have uh, one individual putting in a road, once the road is put in place, then everybody benefits from the road generally unless they restrict the road or put a toll on it. But that's going to be a problem because the person putting in the road is not getting the, the benefit. So there's not an incentive to put in the road for the society as a whole has more need of the road. Therefore, the idea of a freeway system or an infrastructure system being put in place by the government is the idea that there's this public goods and therefore there's a free rider effect and therefore the government basically needs to put in the infrastructure in this case road. the non-rival aspect of the public good meaning that if one individual consumes the public good it doesn't limit someone else's consumption of the public good so in terms of the military we're all consuming the right to be free of attack from others by the protection of the military our consumption of that doesn't limit someone else's consumption of that that's going to be part of the idea of a public good we can see that on the freeway as well if we go on the freeway, theoretically, it shouldn't limit someone else's ability to go on the freeway. Now, of course, we see that there's problems with that because in terms of a freeway and a lot of public goods, they're not going to be pure public goods. And there's really no such thing as a pure public goods because the non-exclusive and non-rival principles aren't usually uh, to the fullest degree. The military is probably the best example of it, but that's kind of like an ideal. The public good is going to be the ideal most things that have the public good argument aren't going to be pure public goods, but they have characteristics of the public goods, such as the freeways. And we know that uh, if, if I drive on the freeway, it doesn't limit someone else's driving on the freeway until the freeways get congested, in which case it does kind of limit someone else to drive on the freeway. When we think about the public good, we're going to say that the social benefit of the public good is going to be the aggregate of all the demand curves. So if we were to add up all the demand curves for all the individuals that are benefiting from the public good, we can imagine that to be the demand curve for the public good. Although when we think about a public good, we think about the idea that if we consume the public good, it doesn't diminish someone else's consumption of the public good. And we think about the idea that once the public good is put in place, then everybody can benefit from it. That does not mean that the demand curves are going to be the same for each individual. So if we think about the freeways, of course, if we have a business that we drive on the freeway, for example, if we're a trucking business and we drive on the freeway a lot, then the demand for the freeway for the trucking company is going to be a lot higher than, for, for example, someone who just rides their bike around, they don't go on the freeway at all. Now, the person that doesn't go on the freeway at all does still benefit from the freeway in some aspect they do have a social benefit because they, they're probably receiving stuff from the trucking company at least or, or you know consuming things that are shipped on the freeway but their their benefits not going to be as high as as the other benefits so we're not saying that everybody's benefits for the public goods are the same we're not all benefiting the same but if we were to imagine everybody's demand curves and then aggregate them we can aggregate basically the market demand or conceptually aggregate the market demand for a public good
Imperfect information is the next area we will look at in terms of market problems. So when we make our models, we often make the assumption that there's perfect information through everybody within the market. So if we're talking about a transaction between A and B, we make the assumption that both A and B have all of the relevant information in order to make a particular decision. And therefore, the negotiation between A and B will end up with an optimal decision for them both as they're both looking for their self-interest. But, of course, that's not always the case. When we look at transaction, it's very often the case that uh, one individual has more information than the other information individual, which can lead to transactions that are not optimal. So that's going to be the question of imperfect information. How would this work and how could we deal with it? Well, we can take an example of something like a car dealership. We can say used car. If we're selling a used car, then there's often going to be imperfect information, meaning the seller usually has a lot more information about that used car. They've, been, they've had it for quite some time than the purchaser who knows nothing about the used car. If we think about the signaling involved in the sale of a used car, just the fact that a used car is on the market to be sold signals to the buyer that it's probably not a very good car, otherwise it wouldn't be on the market. Now that might be a false signal, that might not be correct, but you can see how the buyer would see that signal just based on the lack of information. They don't know everything about the car, they have to make assumptions about what they do know. They do know that the car is on the market, and therefore the buyer is trying to sell it, <laughs> and so that would be a signal that it wouldn't be on, in the best con condition. How can we deal with that car? What would be the result of that would be, of course, that the person who is trying to sell a car that is in good condition, that should draw a, a good price based on the reality of the situation, will, will not be able to draw the, the price that they would want because they have a signal to the buyers. Buyers are expecting a lower price. So that's going to probably be pushing down the price to cars that are, are uh, better, are overvalued, that, are not, that don't have problems with them. And the question would be, well, how do we deal with that kind of problem uh, in the market in this imperfect information? One is that there could be counter signals, there could be signals for the person that is selling the car to the, to the purchaser. One is the fact the price, price is going to be our major signal, of course, when we, when we just look at things and we purchase things, the higher price, we assume it's going to be better, lower prices, we assume it's going to be worse, and somewhere in the middle, we would assume that that's going to be the average. In terms of the car, we could add other types of signals. We could have warranties on it, for example. A warranty could be a counter signal saying, hey, this car does have longevity, it does have quality, we're going to put a warranty on it. So that's one way that this lack of information this particular example could help. We could think of policies in terms of how to deal with this information. So for example, we could have a regulation in the market to have individuals provide correct information. So we could have regulations saying that, you know, you have to have the odometer be correct, or you have to list these certain stats about the car. We see these regulations on a lot of different things. If we have food, you know, how many calories are going to be in something, how much fat, is there saturated fat, and, and that type of thing. All this kind of information we see it, of course, in health restrictions and labeling and all that kind of stuff on regulations license we could license individuals in the market to require them to provide full information so we'll talk about some examples of some licensing processes that we could have on this now i do want to point out that these seem like really re reasonable and oftentimes they are really reasonable types of policies but there are costs to them as well so if, for example if we were to have uh, anybody that sells foods list a very comprehensive a uh, summary of you know everything that's going to be in the food as well as the calorie count and different types of mineral content that's going to be in there a uh, smaller producers actually really kind of struggle with that because that that's going to be something that's going to be costly and to smaller producers that could be something that that could drive them out of the market it could be a difficult uh, thing to produce although it does seem like a reasonable thing to do so we do need to measure the costs and benefits it's also important to note that as more information is out there there may be market solutions that are becoming more re re relevant because of more information. So we have the internet now and we have more people that are closer together and talking more information around. And a lot of these types of things could be solved with market forces in some cases. For example, if we had the used car information, we, we may have engineers that basically all they do is appraise the car. So we might have a market where we go ask an engineer to go look at the car in order to appraise the value of the car separately. And of course, that's a, a whole industry that's, that's growing up in the market in order to compensate for a problem within the market. So that would be one example of a market solution. The market is trying to figure out how to, how to deal with that information. We also, of course, have a lot of other information in terms of like Yelp and, and reviews that are going to be on the market. We can look at prices that are a lot more relevant, a lot more information that's a lot more relevant. So as information grows, there might be market-based solutions that actually solves some of these problems and may do it more efficiently 
than uh, a government type uh, of policy that would be aimed at solving these problems. Licensing as an example of a government policy would be something like any type of profession often has a very uh, difference between the amount of information between the, part the, the professional and the non-professional. So if we talk about the, a law firm or if we talk about uh, doctors or we talk about accounts or, or brokers, these are all areas where the person that has the body of knowledge is, has a body of knowledge that is completely unfamiliar to someone else and therefore it's going to create a big difference in information. How, how do we generally handle that? Well, most professions we have some kind of licensing process and the licensing process is going to give, make sure that everybody has that minimal amount of information. It also can help to restrict through that licensing process certain types of actions and, and behaviors within that process. Other options within this type of market, if we're a patient or if we're, we're trying to get a lawyer, again, we don't really, we, we have to basically trust the lawyer in most cases because we don't have enough information to really understand if they, if they know what they need to know to help us out. But uh, there's a lot of, and so licensing does help in that process. But again, there's a lot of other information now that there's more communication out there. And there could be policies in terms of, should we have grades be more open? Should we be able to look up the grades for doctors and stuff and see how high they graduated within their class? Should we be able to see success rates and how well doctors have done in certain, certain areas and how well certain uh, procedures have done? Uh, obviously fees, should we have fees that are going to be transparent so that we know fees and we can compare fees? And then again, references, things like Yelp. These are all things that uh, are influencing professions as well in, in a big way. So as we look through these market failures, we have recognized, of course, that they are market failures. There's going to be these, these areas where the markets do have problems. And we need to also recognize, however, that the government is going to have similar problems as well. So if, when we come up with the government solutions, we need to be very, very careful that we do not put in a government solution that is going to be worse than the actual problem. We don't want the treatment to be worse than the problem. So let's take a look at some things within the government side that, that are kind of problems when we implement the government information. What is going to be some problems when we try to put the uh, government interventions in order to shore up some of these problems with like externalities and public goods and lack of information. So one is that the government doesn't have an incentive to correct problems. So if we put, if we have the government basically take over a certain sector, that's similar to having a monopoly, meaning uh, there's only one person in control, therefore if there's problems, there's not really any pressure for the government to do things better. That's why markets are efficient in a lot of ways, because if one company is not doing something well, someone else will do it better and drive them out of the market. The government, by definition, is a monopoly if they basically regulate the market completely and have control of the market. Therefore, there's no one willing to drive them out of the market. There's no real pressure to do better. <laughs> and that's going to be one of the problems that, that anytime we have one individual, one person in control of a particular market, government doesn't have enough information to deal with the problem. So a lot of the things that we've talked about, we've talked about conceptually where these problems are, and we've talked about us not being at the perfect point in, for the market to, to benefit. And conceptually, that makes sense. But in terms of hard numbers in any particular area, that's, gonna, that's a lot more difficult to actually nail down the hard numbers. What actually is the de that theoretical difference in terms of numbers? And that information often isn't there to make the best decisions for the government. So we can th see a lot of things in theory, but it's, it's harder to, to, make the, to get the information to put the actual policies that we th would be most efficient in there in a lot of cases. Uh, intervention in the markets almost always is more complicated than we originally thought. And this, this has been seen in countless cases where the government has, has gone in and kind of put policies within a free market. And even economists who have a lot of tools that can make a lot of predictions about what will happen if certain policies are put in place make a lot of mistakes and, or, and aren't able to see a lot of things that human behavior will happen based on the new policies. So we can observe what happens when a policy is put in place, but we got to be really, really careful when we put in uh, a policy into the market because we need to make sure that the market doesn't act in adverse ways just based on the incentives of the new policy in the market. A lot of examples where that has gone wrong and if we, if these uh, things that happen within the market that are unforeseen are negative, which they normally will be, again, it could cause the policy to be worse than the original problem. Uh, the bureaucratic nature of the government intervention does not allow for fine tuning. We know that the government is a, a law to be made in the government is going to take a process and that's intentional. The law is supposed to be slow to implement. 
So therefore, if we're talking about problems, that, especially problems that are in the short run, it's going to be very difficult to, to set a policy to deal with a problem in the short run because by the time the problem is put in place in terms of a law, uh, it, it may be too late for the short run. And also, if we put the law in place and we think, we think that it needs some kind of fine-tuning, some kind of changes, that usually requires another law. And, and again, that kind of tweaking to policies is difficult to do. So once we have the government, even if we knew exactly what the government intervention policy should be as economists, we would then need to basically get the policy to put it into place, policy being intentionally slow and uh, that being very difficult to do in some cases. Government intervention leads to more government intervention oftentimes. So many times when we, when we put in the government intervention, we see that there's some negative benef negative problems that happen from that intervention that we had not yet foreseen. And if that's the case, you oftentimes the, the solution to that isn't, well, let's look for market-based solutions to this problem. It's often the case that we say, well, we put the, the policy in to solve this problem. It caused this problem. Now we need another policy to solve this problem. And what we're really doing is kind of tampering in the market and then, and then trying to patch the holes that were caused by the problem by tampering in the market in the first place is something that could possibly happen. And so these are just some problems within government intervention. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't have any government intervention. Obviously, there's going to be areas where we need government intervention. But it does mean that when we put in the government intervention in certain areas, we've got to be really, really careful that, uh, the, that the cure isn't worse than the problem we're trying to cure.